Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Craig Rustasi. I direct disability studies here at Hofstra, and I want to welcome you to this event. I want to begin by thanking the Hofstra Cultural Center, um, Ethelene Collins and Carol Mallison uh, for their funding and assistance with this. They are always great to work with, and I'm always grateful for their help. Um, I'm going to begin by putting a little bit of a Hofstra context to the presentation that you are about to hear. Um, and then I will focus on, um, after I've kind of introduced the Hofstra context, uh, I will be introducing our speaker um, directly. So Dr. Berger will be talking about wheelchair basketball at Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, which was a very elite program. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring him here, though, was because Hofstra has its own history with wheelchair basketball, and I'm hoping that we can establish a bit of a context for that. So the Rolly Dutchman were a wheelchair basketball team here at Hofstra um, that was active from 1969 to 1982. I will try to keep my remarks here limited because as a special guest, uh, we have um, Mark Drummer, a Hofstra alum who was one of the students who really founded and got moving the wheelchair basketball team here. So I will be asking Mark to um, respond to um, Dr. Berger's presentation, give us a little bit of a Hofstra context or Hofstra contrast for what he talks about. So I'll try not to say too much. Um, many of you may know that Hofstra um, made an early commitment to an accessible campus starting in 1963. The, trustees um, voted to begin making Hofstra's campus accessible. Um, that meant, and they also, along with that, uh, promoted a program to um, recruit and meet the needs of students with disabilities. Uh, that meant that there was a critical mass on campus for a disabled student organization. Um, that organization was named PUSH, People United in Support of the Handicapped. This is a photograph of a number of PUSH members who uh, went to Albany to lobby the state legislature and then Governor Rockefeller. There was a close relationship between Push and the Rolling Dutchman. Uh, Mark Drummer was a member of the Dutchman. He was also an officer with Push. Um, there were a lot of connections um, in that way. So um, maybe a high watermark would have been in 1979. They were conference champions. But the whole concept of a conference uh, will prompt me to talk a little bit about what was um, particular about the Rolling Dutchman and maybe in one of the ways in which they'll be different from what uh, Dr. Berger will discuss uh, with Wisconsin Whitewater. Um, this is a page from, uh, I believe, the, maybe the 1974 yearbook, uh, but it actually includes lots of information about the Rolling Dutchman that I'm going to try to very briefly unpack. Um, so first of all, if you look at their opponents, you'll see that there are no other universities on this list. Uh, the Rolling Dutchman were only the second collegiate wheelchair basketball team in the United States, um, the first on the East Coast. As Dr. Berger will explain, wheelchair basketball began in the post-war period, maybe growing out of um, rehabilitation programs for World War II veterans. And by the 1960s, there were a number of um, club teams in the Metro New York area. Some of them were affiliated with organizations. You'll see here the Eastern Paralyzed Veterans of America, Chargers who were one of those. Some were affiliated with employers. The Bull of a Watch Company um, tended to employ people with mobility disabilities because it wasn't really a problem to do the work they were asked to do. Some just local affiliations like the Brooklyn uh, Whirlaways. Um, but so the Rolling Dutchmen were playing with uh, people who were really probably already launched or playing against, people who were already launched in their careers and their lives, um, people who were probably older than the average college student. Um, the last opponent on this list is uh, the stand-up basketball team here at Hofstra. Back in those days, we were the Flying Dutchman before we became the Pride. Um, there were fairly regular exhibition games um, between the Rolling Dutchman and the stand-up basketball team. They didn't work like this. Um, the stand-up team players would have been in wheelchairs and would have been learning uh, through experience about the abilities um, and skills that would be required to play competitive wheelchair basketball. Also on that page is a list of players, and I'll use that to illustrate the sort of different 
backgrounds that informed many of the players on the Rolling Dutchman. Um, so the first player here, Pete Aka, was a Paralympian. He played wheelchair basketball in the 1960s, in the 1960 Rome Paralympics. So we had some very elite players. Second player on the list was a faculty member in the School of Education. He had played wheelchair basketball at the University of Illinois, um, where that was actually the first uh, program in the country. Um, came to Hofstra uh, as a faculty member and did play for a few years before an untimely death um, with the um, Rolling Dutchman. Um, you'll also see on the list, as I said, our guest, Mark Drummer. Farther down, I'll be talking a little bit about Dan Sullivan and some of his contributions. Um, but you may also notice the name um, Ron Kobik. Um, this is a picture, excuse me, of, of Pete Aka. Um, but moving on to Kobik, um, you'll see him here on the, the right margin of this photograph. He's number 10. You can blow him up a little bit. Uh, but as you may know, Ron Kovic is uh, a Hofstra, um, attended Hofstra and went on to write uh, the memoir Born on the Fourth of July. Um, and uh, that memoir was eventually produced as a film. Kovic was a Vietnam veteran who um, was um, injured and lost the use of his legs um, in the war. He became a activist against the war. Um, and obviously here um, spent some time um, playing on the Rolling Dutchman. Along that list of participants were also people who were not on the team, statisticians, managers, um, students in the disability community at Hofstra um, participated with the Rolling Dutchman in a number of ways, sometimes even just in going out for pizza after a game. Um, but one of those uh, participants was listed on, the, uh, on that yearbook page as statistician. Uh, that's Neil Jacobson. He's pictured here um, later in, in life. Um, he um, has been a very successful executive at Wells Fargo, uh, working in information technology. But in a kind of draft memoir that he shared with me, he talks in the quotation on the left um, about the camaraderie that he experienced um, from the team members of the Rolling Dutchman being lifted at one point in time uh, at the end of the season and um, carried around uh, the court um, and the kind of connection that created. And I think it illustrates maybe some of the connections that were made between the Rolling Dutchman and other students with disabilities on campus. Um, the Rolling Dutchman also spread wheelchair basketball in the local area. Dan Sullivan, who I mentioned earlier, coached a uh, wheelchair basketball team at the Human Resources School, which is now the Viscardi School nearby. Um, unfortunately, over time, the Rolling Dutchman felt um, that they were experiencing not a lot of support here at the university, having trouble getting court time. So eventually they were voted to become a club team unaffiliated with the university. And that led to the Long Island Lightning who were featured um, in this uh, article. Sullivan actually went a little bit further when he uh, moved to the Philadelphia area. He also promoted wheelchair basketball there and he is memorialized every year by a tournament um, in the Philadelphia area um, in his name. That brings me to our speaker, primary speaker for today, Dr. Ronald Berger. Um, so when I became interested in the Rolling Dutchman and looking for some kind of scholarly context to understand what they had done, it very quickly became clear to me that the person who had done the most sustained work on wheelchair basketball uh, was Ronald Berger. He's an emeritus member of the sociology department at Wisconsin Whitewater, University of Wisconsin Whitewater, the author or editor of at least 11 books in sociology, some on criminology and criminal justice, some on the Holocaust and memory, and several on uh, disability and disability studies, including the book he will speak most about today, Hoop Dreams on Wheels, which is a study of um, the elite wheelchair basketball team at Wisconsin Whitewater. Um, also, um, Wheelchair Warrior is a memoir that he co-authored uh, with one of those players, Melvin Joette. Um, and he's also published an introduction to disability studies. Um, so I think he is eminently qualified to um, give us an understanding of some of the sociological implications of wheelchair basketball, um, and then maybe help us understand our own experience a little bit better. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Berger. I'm just going to drop my screen share here. Um, 
be with you in a minute. Just trying to, there we go. Hello, can everybody, can you see that screen? Looks good. Okay, very good. Nice to be with you, everyone. Um, I just had to get used to how this is working here. Okay, um, I want to talk to you about uh, as Craig indicated, the development and some of the players of uh, the wheelchair basketball program at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and also put that in some sociological concept, context. When I first started studying uh, this topic and interviewing players, I was surprised to learn there were actually some controversy. Uh, clearly, the literature and the experiences of players indicated a lot of the psychological and health benefits of sports for people with disabilities. Uh, but there are also complaints about elite athletics and the so-called super crip and society's uh, kind of focus on, on people who demonstrate uh, extraordinary skills with their disabilities, leaving a lot of people out, a critique of the hyper competitiveness an obsession with winning. That is true of competitive sports and competitive disability sports as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, watching the tremendous amount of skills exhibited by uh, highly trained wheelchair basketball players, it really does counter uh, stereotypes about people with disabilities to show the athleticism that's involved. Craig asked me to review a little bit of the history. Uh, in the US, as he mentioned, World War II was a turning point. Unlike the previous World War, uh, World War II, the um, improved battlefield evacuation methods and medical uh, assistance meant that more people who would have otherwise died in previous wars uh, survived. And uh, the foreign and paralyzed veterans of America and started playing in veterans hospitals. And the Birmingham Flying Wheels was the first uh, hospital wheelchair basketball team to tour the country. The Kansas City Wheelchair Bulldozers uh, was the first uh, team outside of the veterans community. Uh, Tim Nugent at the University of Illinois at Galesburg was a very central individual in moving wheelchair basketball to the next level. Uh, Tim uh, soon went on to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, which uh, I would have to say, if you picked any collegiate program in the country today as being an elite program, it's, it's probably the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Whitewater's proximity, we're about four hours from them, uh, meant that, um, uh, we were able to uh, make contact with Tim and uh, benefit from his expertise. And there's actually been movement of uh, players and personnel between Whitewater and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, over the years. Uh, the National Wheelchair Basketball Tournament was first held in 49, the formation of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. Uh, and uh, Marilyn Hamilton, who was injured, paralyzed in a hand gliding accident, is credited along with a couple of her hand gliding fans, uh, friends of developing the first um, sports model wheelchair, which really changed the game and increased the athleticism involved. On the international level, uh, Ludwig Gutman of the National Spinal Cord Injury Center at Stoke Manville Hospital is credited with forming the first international games. The uh, first Paralympics was in the uh, summer of 1960 was formed. Initially, uh, the para and Paralympics tended to connote paraplegic, but over the years, uh, it developed the connotation of being parallel to the uh, able body Olympics. And uh, so that's held every four years, uh, just after the regular Olympic games and in the uh, 
years in between, there's the uh, wheelchair basketball world championship or gold cup. And the uh, 76 was the first winter Paralympics, which was, I guess it's still going on. As far as uh, our program, uh, the study I did involved an interview with three, 13, 13 players across uh, four cohorts between the 1987-2009 period. I mainly uh, focused on elite players, but I did have uh, some non-elite in the sample. Uh, eight had congenital disabilities at birth, uh, five acquired disability in later life, uh, uh, two of them were illnesses. One was uh, a boy who contracted his illness that caused his disability. I think he was about eight or 10 years old. And the other was uh, in the senior year of high school. Three accidents included uh, two automobile accidents and uh, a gunshot injury uh, to Melvin Jewett. I interviewed the founding director, John T Truesdale, he also was the team's first coach uh, and also another able-bodied coach. One of the players that, that I interviewed, one of the elite players was also a coach of the team and the physical ther therapist for multiple decades. Uh, John first came to UW Whitewater, John Truesdale, after working at the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation in Whitewater, uh, some professors in the special education department had gotten a grant and they hired John to administer it. Uh, he is the one who developed our disabled student services now called the Center for Students with Disabilities. And he was director of that for three decades. Uh, John early on uh, went to the University of Illinois to talk to Tim Nugent and he learned about the sport and he uh, came to the conclusion that developing a wheelchair chair sports program would be good for uh, the disabled students services program um, more generally. And uh, Whitewater became the campus in the 26th campus University of Wisconsin system to specialize in services and accommodations for students with disabilities it may be similar to what you have at Hofstra, but it's commonplace in Whitewater to see wheelchairs all around. You get to the point where you don't even think about it at all. Um, there is you know, game strategy uh, to wheelchair basketball. And I want to mention the classification system whereby the different players are given a classification number according to the degree of their disability with students with more severe or, sig or significant disabilities given a lower number than those with a higher number. I think right now uh, uh, that uh, the rules are uh, in the international rules and Canadian rules, the number is given anywhere from one to four and a half. And that's also true in the US. And in international competition, the total number of points that you could put on the floor would be 15 and in US competition, 14. So mixing and matching the players of different classifications, you know, it becomes part of the strategy. Uh, Ron Likens is a coach that I didn't have an opportunity to interview, but I interviewed players who worked with him. And he came to Whitewater in 1986 uh, through 1993. And Ron, by the way, was the coach of the last summer's Paralympic wheelchair basketball team. And he seemed, at watching him, much more mild-mannered. He, he was this kind of Bobby Knight-style coach, uh, yelling and berating players when they made a mistake, throwing things. Uh, not everyone liked that, but the elite and highly competitive players um, excelled under his coaching. And this is really the period in which Whitewater became an elite wheelchair basketball program and started consistently um, developing players who were good enough to be on the national team. Uh, Mike Frogley uh, was initially a player 
who uh, was the first one recruited from Canada. And that's one of the things that Ron Likens introduced at, use, at Whitewater is going out and recruiting players who are already playing uh, rather than just waiting for students to show up and teaching them how to play and especially developing a pipeline with Canada. And, and eventually, uh, you know, early on, we had players from national team from Australia. I'm more recently familiar with players on national teams from Israel and Germany, and there may be other countries. So uh, we have had uh, elite players from other countries on their respective wheelchair basketball national teams coming to Whitewater to learn how to improve their game. Tracy Chenoweth was the able-bodied coach that I interviewed, um, and he was the coach at the time. Uh, Melvin Jewett, Craig mentioned, he, he was the first player I interviewed, uh, and uh, Melvin was a, uh, a young man from Chicago. He was uh, very athletic as a youth. He played on the high school football team, though by his own admission, he, he wasn't very disciplined, but he could run the 40 yard dash in 4.2 seconds. He was involved in Chicago gangs and was shot and paralyzed in a gang dispute. And wheelchair basketball was quite central to his transition to a life living with a disability. When he was recovering at the uh, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which had a wheelchair basketball team, uh, being introduced to that changed his life. He, he recalled when he first showed up uh, at a game uh, with his hospital wheelchair and watching these people with a more sports style wheelchair, you know, who were fairly highly skilled. Uh, and he was put in the game at, at the very end, just to give him a little chance. And he, he really struggled pushing his chair, but he, he pushed it, th threw up a shot, uh, his chair fell backwards and he made the shot. And, and afterwards he told me he, he was just delighted and to being around these guys. Later, he was introduced to the Chicago Sidewind Winders, which was one of the best adult teams at the country. And just watching how fast they uh, pushed their chairs behind the back passes, you know, layups, three point shots. He just fell in love with the game. This is a picture with Bill Clinton after the 2000 Paralympics in which the US um, got a bronze medal. Uh, on the right, is Eric Barber, who had a low classification because of the degree of his disability, but he was an excellent three-point shooter. And to have a low classification and somebody who can make three-point shots was um, a tremendous asset. And he was also a Paralympic. I believe he's wearing a Milwaukee Bucks jersey there. And uh, some of the players on the Whitewater team, you know, played with the, uh, NBA Milwaukee Bucks affiliate. And just like some of the NBA teams have women basketball team affiliates, uh, they also have wheelchair basketball game affiliates. You know, and looking at this uh, photo and Eric being knocked over, one of the things about the whitewater culture is that the players never allowed other players to help them up. You know, they always had to, you know, be helped uh, or get up on their own. Uh, I didn't see anything like that in the last Paralympics, so I think the culture has changed where other players were helping the players when they fell over. But, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, clashing going on. I have to tell you a story about Eric Barber uh, encounter with Michael Jordan. In 1987, there was a program, uh, NBC Sports Fantasy, where viewers could, you know, write into the program and tell them, what their sports fantasy was. And if they thought that would make a good show, kind of a reality show, uh, they might put them on. And Eric wrote that he wanted to play Michael Jordan in a game of wheelchair basketball. Uh, Eric was from Chicago, you know, Jordan was, you know, just emerging as, as a superstar that he is, you know, and Jordan had never been in a chair before. As Craig was saying, when he talked about the, uh, 
stand-up wheelchair basketball players playing the Hofstra wheelchair basketball players. It takes a while to get used to the program or rather to the, to the uh, chair. And uh, Eric actually, since he was such a good shooter, it, he got out to a 14 to two point lead with Michael Jordan, uh, two points a basket playing to 20 points. And finally, Eric said, Jordan started getting the hang of it and caught up to a 14 to 10 uh, with the game in Eric's favor. But Eric was cool, made his shots, and he beat Michael Jordan in a one-on-one -on -one game of wheelchair basketball, 20 to 14. Eric says there's probably no other person in the world except for Michael Jordan's brother when they were growing up that has ever beat Michael Jordan in a game of basketball. Um, Michael Frogley, I mentioned, who came from Canada. The uh, second to the right, Jeremy Opie Lottie was uh, injured, paralyzed in an automobile accident when he was eight. And he came to the summer camp wheelchair basketball program that had been started by uh, Mike Frogley at a time when he was coach. And uh, they're developed in Whitewater, what I call a chain of mentorship, you know, where uh, people of different ages mentored each other. And, and Jeremy, his nickname was Opie. That they, they all players gave everybody nicknames because he, as a kid, he looked like uh, the character Opie on the old Andy Griffith uh, TV show. And Opie went on to be a, a Paralympic wheelchair basketball player. He was one of the people on the uh, cover of my book. And Opie is now the, the uh, coach of the Whitewater wheelchair basketball team. And an example of this chain of mentorship, somebody who starts out as a young boy coming to summer camp, becomes an elite player, becomes a coach. It, it really is quite remarkable. Uh, Matt Lawaki was not an elite wheelchair basketball player, although he was on the Paralympic, uh, uh, wheel, uh, rather Paralympic um, volleyball team. And he was born without any legs. And he, he would like to do these, you know, incredible things like that. And he was a motivational speaker. Uh, Amy Lively was one of two women that I interviewed. In the 1990s, uh, Amy was on a women's wheelchair basketball team, but they didn't have enough women to play. So they basically played for recreation with able-bodied women. There, there was one game when Amy played uh, because they need uh, one of the players of a, a lower classification couldn't make the tournament. And so they put her in. So she gave me a a, a woman's perspective, uh, her and another woman that I'll show uh, later, you know, did talk about uh, some of the attitudes of some of the male athletes who didn't want a day to go out with uh, women with disabilities, something that maybe some of them changed with, uh, you know, more maturity. Uh, Amy would talk about feeling like she was in the middle between the uh, male players who were highly competitive and the other students with disabilities. And there was a divide between them. Uh, the assumption that I had that there would be camaraderie between uh, people, all people with disabilities, uh, there really was a divide between the students and the, and the players. And Amy told me a little bit about that and how she was kind of a go-between between the, the two groups. Dan Ferreira is another uh, individual I interviewed as well. And he was not an elite player, but he did go on to become assistant coach the last I heard at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. This is uh, Christina Ripp. She actually was, along with Opie, one of the uh, kids that were at our summer camp program. She did not actually go to Whitewater as an undergraduate. She went to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which had um, uh, a very strong women's wheelchair basketball program. But she came back to Whitewater after she was done playing and um, is now the coach of uh, a pretty successful women's wheelchair basketball 
team that sends a lot of elite players to the Paralympics. I'm not sure if uh, Christina was the coach of the women's wheelchair basketball team last summer, but I did see her with the men's team. And uh, my impression was that she was one of the assistant coaches with the men's team. There's Opie, uh, Matt Scott, uh, who went on to play professionally in Turkey, making a decent amount of money. Uh, Matt is now, I think, in his mid-30s, and so he's no longer the star of the Paralympic teams that he was at one time, but he, he still came off the bench and was playing there last summer. Uh, Matt, a few years ago, um, did a Nike commercial, one of those Just Do It commercials. Uh, and so he was selected of all the players, uh, you know, around the country to do this commercial. And it was, I think, the beginning of more presence of uh, people with disabilities in uh, commercials and just on in TV and generally. And this has really evolved uh, that there's even much more of that that you can see on TV, even coverage of the Paralympics than there was even 10 years ago. And a lot of that, I believe, has to do with the um, large number of disabled Afghanistan and Iraq war veterans that uh, are now living in our society. And that's always been the case with disability issues, going back to what we talked about after World War II. You know, the um, disabled war veterans have often been for society at large, a more sympathetic constituency, and they've helped move societal attitudes in a positive direction toward people with disabilities. Uh, Joe Johnson um, developed cancer in his senior year in high school. He was um, an outstanding high school player. Uh, he, if he hadn't developed the cancer and uh, lost part of his leg, he would have been uh, hotly recruited by high level college teams, uh, but he got into wheelchair basketball. And this was true of a lot of the uh, uh, players who acquired their disability you know, later in life. They had previously played competitive uh, able body athletics. And so getting involved in wheelchair sports uh, really helped them move on with his life. Joe was a pretty uh, intimidating presence, kind of was like the Shaq O'Neal, you know, wheelchair basketball at the time, uh, tattoos all over his body, you know, so the, the strategy when we played with Joe is to get him the ball, <laughs> and people couldn't stop him, and if they ganged up on him, he could throw it out to the outside, and someone would make a three-point shot. Jerry Campbell, I on the left, I interviewed with my study, and here shows you a little bit of the camaraderie. All of them have whitewater tattoos. It's just a picture of Mike uh, Frogley. I'm not sure what year this was when the women's team at University of Illinois won the championship. Mike was a, is a very competitive guy. He uh, was an excellent high school basketball player. He got in an automobile accident when he was 21, uh, as I mentioned, the first player from Canada to come to Whitewater. Now uh, for kind of some sociological themes, if you will. One of the things I talked about uh, with the players was, you know, their pathway to involvement in wheel sports, some of which I, you know, had uh, alluded to. Uh, there was parental encouragement for a lot of people, or in the absence of a parent, uh, other adult role models, whether it was a uh, physical therapist, uh, coaches, or and especially other players. You know, the camaraderie, is, as Craig suggested, was, you know, really a draw for people. Um, I also you know, talk to them about the difference between recreational and, and competitive athletics. I mean, recreational athletics, it's, it's for fun. You know, these elite players, it, it's all about winning, you know, 
training, working hard every day. You know, Whitewater provided an opportunity where you had a, a substantial number of players who were, you know, into this, you know, and often young kids who might be want to come involved in wheelchair basketball, you know, they don't have that, you know, there, there may be some club teams, some might have to travel, you know, 50, 60 miles, but, you know, Whitewater, there are all these people in the gym, you know, practicing so forth. I kind of mentioned, you know, the role models and the chain of mentorship, which spills over to other pursuits. I wanted to share a quote from Tracy Chinoweth, who was the coach at the time I was doing my study. And he said, the mentality of the guys who've been successful in the program being a no nonsense, give it everything you got type of thing is that it's not just about basketball. We try to build that mentality about school, you know, about social relationships, about everything. There's a commitment and determination that these guys have that exists beyond the basketball court. But as I mentioned, there are nonetheless, you know, divisions with people who aren't into that kind of competitiveness. John Truesdale, the founding coach, told me, I thought that the athletes would be good role models for the other students and help them, but it didn't work out that way. We used to have a much more broadly based program with intramural wheelchair, football, softball, floor hockey, and track and field, but that stuff just went away and never really recovered. So just as at Hofstra, you had trouble sustaining I suppose, you know, the wheelchair basketball program generally, we had trouble sustaining the opportunities we had outside of, you know, this elite wheelchair basketball program. Uh, Eric Barber told me we're probably the victim of our own success. Back when I came here, we were still struggling to fill the team, still trying to get people to play. But after a while, we became pretty successful. We started winning a lot of games, going to the important tournaments, getting coverage in wheelchair sports publications, doing really well. So interesting, his phrase, victim of our own success. There also was an attitude among some of the elite players about other students with disabilities who they thought were lazy. Um, Amy uh, Bliley, the woman I mentioned earlier, prior to coming to Whitewater, she never used a uh, power wheelchair, but you know, at Whitewater, it's hard to get around. Uh, she told me, I'm gonna read another quote. The campus is so large, me pushing a chair around here isn't too feasible. There's been some athletes who've told me if it wasn't for you, I would have had real misconceptions about people in shower power chairs thinking that we're lazy and just in power chairs because it's easy when in reality it's the key to our independence. Then again, I've heard people from the other side who say, I thought all the athletes were real jerks. At first they didn't want to have anything to do with me because they felt like I thought I was better than them because I play sports. But after meeting some of the guys on the team, they said, now I can see that they're really nice. They worked really hard. Opie, had the view that the disabled athletes have, quote, a huge responsibility to be seen as independent. So people aren't saying, oh, he can't do anything if we don't help him. And Opie told me that he thinks some people with disabilities feign more dependence than they need and are not, quote, pushing themselves to the limit of our independence. And these kind of divisions are something that I wouldn't really have uh, expected before I started studying the topic. The last slide I have here um, raises questions about the difference and similarities between disability sports and able-bodied sports, you know, and whether disability sports should always be separate from 
able-bodied sports. Part of this entails a definition of what is a sport. And it, are disability sports, quote, real sports? A leading sports sociologist defines a sport as an institutionalized competitive activity that involves physical exertion or the use of re relatively complex physical skills by participants who are motivated by internal and external rewards. So what is the significance of a wheelchair in making wheelchair basketball a quote, real sport? Some of it has to do with, with who gets to play, you know. When non-disabled students are not allowed to play wheelchair basketball or any other wheelchair sport like sled hockey that involves a piece of equipment, it remains a, a separate but equal sport. You know, one way to think about this is to think about the wheelchair is just a piece of equipment, you know, like a bat or a baseball club or a hockey stick, you know. Uh, of course, the, the main reason to exclude non-disabled players from playing is to make sure that you have opportunities for disabled people to play because people in a wheelchair who have more upper body function you know, can can play better. But as Tracy Chinowith, who's able-bodied, told me, a able-bodied person doesn't have any more functionality in a wheelchair than somebody who's missing part of their leg or foot or even a toe. You know, even with a classification system, uh, you would give that person the higher classification to the extent that they would take opportunities away. It would take opportunities away from the higher classified person. You know, on the other hand, do non-disabled people want to play? So what I found, the non-disabled people typically who might want to play are those who have a relative or friends who play and they want to play with them. In Canada, um, they don't exclude non-disabled people from, from playing you know, in, in Canadian games. And then they maintain the classification system. You know. So this is a more in, inclusive, you know, kind of approach. There's also this notion of the distinction between the Paralympics and the Olympics. And the argument I'm making wouldn't apply to any sport, but it, let me limit it, my observations to, you know, wheelchair basketball. Uh, in the 1990s, Brad Hedrick, who is one of the, or he's a little older now, but was one of the leading coaches in wheelchair basketball. He, he developed really the first uh, coaching manual, you know, with strategy and so forth that other coaches use. And in the 1990s, he was trying to lobby the Olympics to include wheelchair basketball uh, as an Olympic sport along the arguments that I was suggesting, that's just a piece of equipment. In fact, this whole argument I'm making is, is uh, adopted from Brad Hedrick. And Hedrick's argument is, you know, why at the time they were, uh, the, the International Olympic Committee was fast tracking other recreational sports like beach volleyball and mountain biking, you know, why not wheelchair basketball? You know, is this any less athletic than ping pong? you know, or curling or some of the other Olympic sports. And what keeps it separate is the fact that it's played by people with, with disabilities who from the eyes of the Olympic Committee aren't real athletes. Of course, this argument that Hedrick is making is based on opening up the game in general to anybody who wants to play. The elite athletics that I interview would have no problem with competing against anybody, you know, if they wanted to learn how to use the chair. On the other hand, if you didn't maintain a classification system, opportunities for people with more uh, significant disabilities in competitive athletics might be diminished. 
the overall conclusion that I have is to maybe look at the game as offering a continuum of options, you know, from, you know, just having fun, you know, kind of on model of the Special Olympics where everybody is a winner. And by the way, mentioning the Special Olympics, there was an attitude among the elite players that they're not the Special Olympics. They have this resentment that society tends to look at what they are doing as like the Special Olympics, you know, which don't involve the kind of training, you know, and skill. But there's no reason in an ideal world, which we don't live in and never will, that you couldn't have a continuum options from the Special Olympics model to the highly competitive model where only a few can play. With that, I'm going to come back to the screen without my PowerPoint and turn it over to Craig. I think I got through this in a little shorter time than initially uh, intended, but that's good. We have more time. Yes. Um, and by the way, um, anyone who has questions, if you want to put those into the chat, um, I'll try and call on people um, in that way. But um, I'd like I, to... I have to say, it is a little weird to be talking to just looking at my PowerPoint and not knowing if anybody is really out there. <laughs> we were, <laughs> we were. Um, but I'd like now to call upon uh, Mark Drummer, who I mentioned earlier, who uh, was one of the students who founded the Rolling Dutchman and very interested in um, how he might relate Dr. Berger's findings, his observations about a different kind of team to what the Hofstra experience was. And um, Carol, if you can spotlight Mark, that would be great. See if I can do it. For some reason, it's not allowing me to do that. Oh, uh, does that mean I could or nobody can? You can try. All right, let me try. I'm just going to go to the list of participants. Let's see. Did it work? Yes, it did. I'm here. Mark, we're eager to hear what you have to say. Okay, hi. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's great to be back at Hofstra. It's been a while. So uh, let me start by saying that uh, um, the Whitewater program uh, was way after our program. And uh, that makes a huge difference. When I was growing up um, as a kid in a wheelchair from polio, uh, there were no programs, none in the area or anywhere else that I could participate in as a youth. Uh, that made competitive athletics strictly local for me. But when I was growing up in uh, the neighborhood in which we live, the uh, kids in the neighborhood somehow and that's a mystery to me, accepted me as part of the group. And so if we were out in the street playing stickball, uh, they would ask my little brother uh, if he wanted to run for me. So on contact, he would run. And rules were altered just to allow my participation. And there was no difference between me or any of the other kids in the neighborhood as far as, oh, we don't really want him to play. Uh, and somehow I find that today amazing because the rest of society uh, never thought of it that way. Uh, they always uh, assume that uh, if you're in a wheelchair, you, you can't think and you can't act and you need help. So that, of course, was not the case. I became a sports fan because uh, my parents, uh, my, my dad especially was a sports fan. My brother was a sports fan. Everyone in the neighborhood discussed sports all the time. We played every sport there was to play, including uh, one winter uh, when the uh, driveway iced over, we played ice hockey and you'll never guess who was the goalie defending <laughs> the goal, defending the open garage door with a garbage can cover. <laughs> so 
those kind of adaptations allowed me to uh, become a big sports fan of all sports. Um, in particular, uh, my father used to take us to uh, Yankee games, because uh, not Met games, because there were no Mets back then. And uh, a Ranger game at the Garden, I remember that well. And um, in addition to that, um, my, brother's, uh, my brother was on a Little League team. Of course, I couldn't play Little League, but they were happy to make me the scorekeeper and uh, help out with whatever other chores were available. And they made me part of the team. And when it came time to go to Yankee Stadium for uh, the annual uh, Little League trip to Yankee Stadium, I was included. And there were no accessible seats back then. So I got, you know, had to get carried wherever they were sitting, which was just a matter of, okay, let's do it. Which, you know, again, seems today to me to be amazing. Um, at one point, um, my father, uh, my mom, both my parents took my brother and I to see the Brooklyn Whirlaways play. They were a nationally ranked team uh, and really good. And uh, they were playing a game against the Richmond Rim Riders in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And uh, that was like unbelievably impressive. I'm going like, wow, I got to try that someday, you know. But there were no youth teams at the time. So there was no outlet for that for me. Um, uh, however, in my high school, they had a rifle team, didn't require much mobility. It just required a good eye. And, uh, my, uh, uh, my local police boys club taught me how to shoot. My mother used to drag me downstairs to the rifle range and then back upstairs when, when I was done. And, uh, we, uh, I learned how to shoot enough and I was on my JV, um, rifle team and eventually in my senior year on the varsity rifle team and that that played a large part in my life not because uh i was a terrific marksman but because when i came to hofstra i was uh, made aware that hofstra had a rifle team as well and maybe you should try out for it mark so i did and uh um, I don't know if anybody is uh, listening who knows Roosevelt Hall, I think was the basement of Roosevelt Hall was where uh, the rifle uh, range was. And I don't know if it still is, but it was. So I was trying out for the team. I pretty much had the team made by the end of the week's worth of tryouts. And uh, as I'm coming out of Roosevelt Hall uh, in the vestibule, they had a phone booth, if anybody remembers what a phone booth is. And uh, and there was this guy on crutches in the phone booth. So I just said, oh, let me wait. Cause you know, I could use some athletic experience other than shooting a rifle. Maybe uh, he'd like to shoot some hoops with me. So he comes out of the phone booth and I harass him. Uh, we introduce each other. Turns out that he played for the Brooklyn Whirlaways at the time and was going to Hofstra to get his undergraduate degree. So we became friends, we talked a while, and then uh, a day or two later, I saw this uh, guy in a wheelchair uh, between classes running from one building to another and I chased him down. Not that I was that fast, it's just he wasn't faster than me. <laughs> or he wasn't in as much of a rush. And uh, it turns out that was uh, Dan Sullivan who uh, uh, Craig mentioned uh, quite a bit. And uh, we all decided, the three of us, John Ross, uh, who I pulled out of the phone booth, Dan Sullivan and myself, we would go try and shoot some baskets. So I asked Coach Linner um, in the gym at uh, Calkins Hall, if you remember, that used to be the gym. And he was able to give us a basket during recreation time, which was pretty nice of him considering. And we recruited a few other students who were on campus who had the ability to, to just shoot around and play games. And uh, that's where uh, it basically began. Now, at the time, uh, John Ross had a whole lot of experience playing. Dan Sullivan, who was older, but still a grad, an undergraduate student at Hofstra, um, he was also, at the time, the Eastern Wheelchair Basketball Commissioner. So he was able to, between he and John, was able to get us um, to start thinking about joining the adult league. Now, of course, that required recruiting enough players, getting appropriate wheelchairs, equipment, and gym time. 
So we decided we would play an exhibition season and we were able to get some gym time in Calkins Hall. Uh, and uh, on, a, on a two basket, we played other teams, a couple of other teams that came in. They, of course, beat our brains out. And, uh, but that was not a deterrent. Uh, so uh, the following year, we were admitted to the Eastern Wheelchair Basketball Conference and started to play all the local adult teams. So uh, I have to say that uh, the uh, ability to play athletics at the time was a boost to my self-esteem as it was to the self-esteem of everyone else on the team, I believe. And, um, and I think that helps you throughout the rest of your life because as everybody knows, you know, the famous athlete gets the girl. And uh, it became uh, a very positive force in my education, in the education of others, and later got passed down along the line uh, to the rest of my employment, et cetera. So uh, Hofstra was uh, excited about this program initially. And uh, don't forget, they were, this was 1969 now, and uh, that was, you know, we were only a handful of students on campus that, that were disabled, that were able, elite enough to play wheelchair basketball in some fashion. Not that we were good, just elite enough. And um, uh, the fact that somebody came across with a huge money grant and was able to purchase us uh, 10 wheelchairs to be used by the 10 current members of the team and the coolest thing about those wheelchairs, they were in Hofstra's colors. The back upholstery and the seat upholstery were blue and gold. That was like, oh my God, an unbelievable thing. And we had uniforms with Hofstra, which were modeled after the uh, varsity uniforms. And off we were. We weren't very good. We were playing adults. Um, and um, we were kind of segregated as everybody would expect back prior, this is long before the ADA. Uh, so when you're on campus with a disability, people generally shied away from you unless you knew them or they knew you. And getting to know somebody, like I had able-bodied friends, but they were classmates. I was a commuter because Hofstra students weren't allowed, if you had a disability, to live in the dorms unless you could uh, walk well enough to get down the stairs in case of an emergency without assistance. So that eliminated almost everybody until it was the late 70s when, uh, when Hofstra started to allow people to live in the dorms. Uh, but this was earlier than that. So everybody who was on the team was a commuter. So you really couldn't establish close relationships unless it was with an able-bodied person who was already in your class. So we remained segregated. Uh, people united in support of the handicap course was um, an activist group on campus trying to uh, promote accessibility and uh, equality uh, locally and on campus and remove architectural barriers, which I have to say were plenty. Uh, Craig, you showed that slide about Hofstra's entry into the try to make the campus accessible race. Uh, when I first got to campus, I had five classes in my fall, first fall semester. Four of them were upstairs. And two of them were labs because I was a bio major. And those were up two flights of stairs. So basically, I had a choice if I wanted education to uh, try to make friends with people in the class who would wait for me outside and give me a boost up those stairs, or I wouldn't have an education. So... Um, there were not a whole lot of disabled students on campus. Most of the disabled students kind of hung together because uh, we weren't um, generally accepted in the general population. And that was true uh, nationwide, not just on campus. Uh, don't forget, we didn't have uh, yet have a whole lot of rights or any rights at all uh, in terms of what we could do or should do or be able to do. So we did have a disabled students who uh, were not able to play basketball, but were instrumental in our success. Uh, Neil Jacobson, the, uh, the, the, the 
the statistician, uh, was not only just a statistician, but he also was um, running the administration of the team. And he was the contact for quite a while between us and the Hofstra administration. So that was uh, important. We had uh, team handlers. We had coverage from the Chronicle because somebody I knew knew the editor. So we were able to get some coverage, which made life a whole lot easier on campus. Uh, we um, we ran fundraisers aligned with uh, PUSH. Um, in fact, uh, the games that uh, Craig was talking about with the uh, stand-up varsity team uh, used to be sellout crowds, standing room only every, uh, every time we played them. And it was a raucous, terrific event. And if you noticed on that, that uh, season scorecard that he held up, there was a little number 50 in parentheses. Uh, that was the amount of points we spotted them. Uh, and, uh, and then we just caught up and beat them. Uh, so, but we raised a lot of money from, from those games. Some of that money paid for the first set of electric doors on the original Unispan, which of course is a great benefit to someone in a wheelchair because those doors were pretty heavy. So there were things like that going on all the time. Um, uh, as out, as an outgrowth of push, push was invited to send a, uh, delegation to the, uh, uh, President's Committee on Employment of the Handicap way back when. And um, we were able to, we were out in the, in, the, in the Senate, I was in the Senate building, others were in the Congress, uh, the House of Representatives building, uh, lobbying for passage of Section 504 at the time, which was a, a rudimentary, simple form of a small amount of rights that we would otherwise, uh, were, were waiting to get unsuccessfully lobbying, I might add, for the time being. Um, and uh, so, so they would hang with us, the other disabled kids on, on campus. They were cheerleaders and they were groupies. And, and uh, it was fun. And when we had the ability to uh, transport, um, if we were playing locally, uh, they would often uh, go out with us, like across the street, the Bills Meadowbrook, uh, which is something else now, but same area, same thing. Uh, and uh, so it was a it was a good communal relationship in lieu of being able to go out with uh, to celebrate something with able-bodied kids who really you know had no interest in being with you for the most part. Uh, let's see. So uh, the uh, teams that we played, the Eastern Paralyzed Veterans, uh, one of the first teams that we scrimmaged against. Uh, that was a team made up of adult veterans, and we were college kids. They, uh, the national organization for Eastern Paralyzed Veterans, was a very good activist group and uh, accomplished a lot over the years and still is. But the players on the team, not activists at all, as opposed to at Hofstra, where, where um, being a member of the team was most of our, our team, most of our players many of our players and put it that way we're also members of push so we also had um an activist uh agenda not only just to play basketball and i think that was an important difference between us and all the rest of the teams that we played against so um we never had contact with the national organization of eastern paralyzed veterans but uh uh, but uh, the, uh, we had contact only with the players. So we didn't play any college teams uh, during our time at Hofstra because there largely weren't very many of them. There was Illinois. I don't think White, by the time we, Whitewater was in existence, I'm not sure we were still in existence. And so in order to play a team outside of Long Island, we had to have money to go there. And there was not money to go there. Hofstra wouldn't uh, provide that money. The students, of course, were on student budgets, so they couldn't fund it out of their own pocket for the most part. Yet we were, uh, we, we trained hard and um, we, with the small amount of practice time that we had, if you ask Ron Berger, I'm sure he'll tell you that Whitewater practices maybe five or six days a week. We were lucky to get two hours a week, one time. And uh, that, that eventually became the downfall for the Hofstra team. Uh, the, uh, 
the team did have several terrific accomplishments, I think. For one, uh, one year when we won the Eastern Conference, we had such a good team that we finished 15th in the country amongst the adult teams, which is an amazing accomplishment considering our, our youth and relative inexperience. And uh, we were actually a varsity team. I think it was for only two years, if I remember correctly. And uh, I remember that fondly. <clears throat> I actually have uh, somewhere in my house, a Hofstra varsity letter, which is pretty cool. And um, in addition to that, there was uh, the uh, delegation to the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. When they hold a national tournament every year, they invite a delegation from every team who's in the uh, National Wheelchair Basketball Association, of which we were one. And we sent a delegation, I think it was 73 or thereabouts. Um, and uh, we were the ones that proposed that the NWBA allow women to play. That was, <clears throat> that was, excuse me, that was the, uh, our legislation, our proposal for, uh, put forth by Hofstra. <clears throat> it was accepted and we had the first woman wheelchair basketball player in the NWBA, I believe. Her name was Sue Hong and she was, uh, she did not indicate ever to me anyway, that there was um, anything other than relative camaraderie. There were always issues. There were some comments that, you know, we dealt with them as a team. Um, you know, we had to arrange for a separate uh, locker room, it's facility, et cetera. So it, there was some difficulties with that, but we worked through all of that. And uh, I think that ended up uh, uh, creating the ability of women to play in the NWBA. There was, to my knowledge, there were no other women playing at that time. And there was no strict prohibition against women playing, but we cemented it into, <clears throat> excuse me, into the regulations. So now it, it would it then become a, uh, a legal thing to do. So now let me uh, explain to you, uh, as we were talking about elite athletes versus non-elite athletes. We, most of the time I was at Ostra, we had non-elite athletes, plenty of them. Uh, we had an occasional elite athlete, uh, like Craig mentioned, Pete Aka. Although when Pete Aka was at the peak of his basketball career in 1960, that was a good decade before he came to us. So he was not quite the Pete Aka that he was in 1960, but he was yet a very good and smart player. So he knew what he was doing, which was very helpful. Uh, but we all got along. I mean, nobody said, I played in the Paralympics, so therefore, I'm better than you. That just didn't exist. We were just, you know, teammates. We all looked up to Pete because, you know, he was older. By the time he got the hostel, he was doing his master's at the time, I believe. And, um, you know, so he was several years older than most of the rest of the team. So he had respect of age and experience, but no, no rancor because I'm better than you or you're better than me. And uh, so that was that was one thing. But let me describe what I mean to you by an elite athlete. Um, athletes who are elite are generally stronger, taller, faster, uh, and more talented with elite skills. But we were playing the Brooklyn Whirlways when they got their new home in Fort Hamilton. Uh, this was many years ago. Uh, we all caravan there in our cars and we parked and we got out of the car and the door to the building was up a flight of stairs. We couldn't find a ramp. We went all sent a, a representative all around the building. There was no ramp. Eventually, one of the players on the Brooklyn on Brooklyn's team came out the door just to grab a smoke or something, which happens at the you know back then. And uh, he said, "Hey, what are you guys doing out here? Come on in." He said, "You know, there's a staircase." He says, "Hold on, I'll get some help." The rest of his team came out and dragged us up the stairs. Okay, now you gotta understand that. The team we're playing is dragging us up the stairs. We got into the gym, we changed into our uniforms. They gave us a beating that is seared into my mind. We lost the game 82 to 12. Think about that. <laughs> uh, my coach put me in the game at one point. He said to me, Mark, on offense, I want you to stay at the half court line. And as soon as we throw the ball up, run like the Dickens to get back on defense. Okay, I said. So 
I did that and we threw the ball up. I turned and ran like Dickens. By the time I got to the foul line, their uh, breakaway speeds that was already past me and throwing a layup. So I give you an idea. I remembered that play uh, years down the road and used it uh, as a, when I was coaching and I had a, a speedster on the team. So it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. In addition to that, losing 82 to 12, I never let any team I coach ever do that. <clears throat> so that was uh, a lot of lessons uh, learned. Uh, we also, um, uh, so, so if you want to talk about elite, elite's the team that drags you up the stairs and then beats your brains out. Non-elite is the team that gets dragged up the stairs. So uh, in addition to that, um, we went to, we were invited to a tournament in Toronto and Hofstra funded that, I think it was two years in a row. And we made such a good impression and it was a great tournament because we were playing teams from other countries. We were playing teams uh, from all over Canada. And, um, and we, we, we finished second in the tournament, which was an amazing feat for an American team, an American college team. And the interesting part of that tournament, more so than any other, was that they allowed, as uh, Ron Berger said, able-bodied players to play. Usually it was one at a time. And um, we didn't have any able-bodied players playing. Uh, there, was a, there was an advantage, I thought, physically, as opposed to what uh, Ron said about Brad Hedrick's uh, work, uh, in terms of balance and pushing off with your foot regaining your balance. I thought a lot of that was, you know, in, in many ways related to your legs, not significantly different than a double amp, except you could do it on both sides uh, or a single amp rather. Uh, so, uh, but that was a, uh, that was clearly a, a, an amazing experience. And I was grateful for the chance to have done that. Uh, we represented Hofstra very well after the First year we were there, we got an automatic invite back every year since. We made it back one year, and then the funding ran out, and we just couldn't do it. So at some point in time, as Craig uh, mentioned, uh, the amount of money given to the clubs was decreased, or at least our club. And uh, gym time became <clears throat> catch as catch can. Uh, they would schedule us for two hours gym time on a Thursday. And we'd get there and the whole floor would be covered because they were having a cat show Friday night. And so they already had rearranged the gym. There was a graduation going on, a meeting. Something was always happening that was cutting out our gym time. Uh, the, the majority of our players, and we had a pretty good team at that point, um, the majority of our players said, that's enough. We can't practice. We can't improve. So we started to look around for other options. Uh, one of the players had a connection to the VA and uh, provided, got us uh, the ability to play at Northport VA. Um, we, in order to do that, we had a break away from Hostra. We did. The program died on the vine. There was, there was uh, no attempt to keep us or, hey, maybe we'll, no, none of that. It was just nice having you. See you later. And so we incorporated our own group. That became the Long Island Lightning adult team which many years later, after I retired, uh, a guy named Jim, uh, 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 Nick Katsunas, he, uh, he had recruited a bunch of players because he was into wheelchair racing, uh, a bunch of, let me rephrase that, kids. And uh, he got together a half a dozen kids and he kept begging me for months, come down, teach them basketball. I got a gym, come down. All right, so eventually I did. And that grew into the uh, Long Island Lightning junior team which was funded for quite a while. And uh, proud to say that at one point, um, we won a national championship. We had elite players, we had non-elite players, and I welcomed everybody. And I, my coaching philosophy was to make sure that if I had a non-elite player, I would teach them something that they could do productive on the court that would never show up in the box score, but it would show up in my mind. <clears throat> I'd find myself <clears throat> after, I, <clears throat> after I taught a player, uh, an, a non-elite player, something to do, and I saw them do it on the court in a game, I'd be cheering for them. And everybody's looking at me like, what are you cheering about? We didn't score. And, you know, in my mind, I knew <clears throat> exactly what I was cheering about. Um, we were able to uh, get uh, 
at least 11 players college scholarship money. Um, we were heavily recruited as a program for quite a while. And, um, uh, and that was a great experience that I never had as a player. Uh, Hofstra couldn't recruit. There was nobody to recruit from. Yeah, there was no way to go to high school programs such as the, the ones that we were running uh, because there weren't any. So, you know, we had to wait for students to come to Hofstra to put them on the Hofstra team. And that's just a maybe yes, maybe no. Sometimes you did, sometimes you didn't. So um, in the end, uh, it, it was very sad. The program ended at Hofstra. It could have gone the way uh, that Whitewater did if it had financial support and administrative support and uh, some manner of recruitment. It didn't. And so it's gone, unfortunately. But I have to say one thing. When you think about it, little, little decisions that turn into large life experiences are amazing. I was in <clears throat> Roosevelt Hall waiting for this guy on crutches to get yanked out of the telephone booth. At that point, I said, would I rather play basketball with these guys or join the rifle team? I chose <clears throat> basketball, uh, even though I could shoot a rifle a whole lot better than a basketball. So um, I think <clears throat> in retrospect, I made the right choice. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so we do have time for some questions. Let me adjust the spotlight just a second. Um, and I think maybe one that I might have um, maybe for Dr. Berger is, so in terms of the sort of sociology, um, we have two very different models, right? As far as you talked about the, the strains between the players and the other students with disabilities um, at Wisconsin Whitewater. Um, and there's sort of a different model here. Um, it's a little bit unfair because I'm asking you to, you know, you know a lot about Wisconsin Whitewater, not a lot about Hofstra, but would you attribute that difference to the difference between um, the level of, uh, of elite play, the difference between 1975 and um, the 1995. Um, how would you, what do you think might be factors that would contribute to um, a kind of distance between the players and the other students with disabilities at Wisconsin Whitewater and more of a collaborative attitude um, at Hofstra? Well, I think probably, you know, both factors. I mean, the, um, the time period um, allowed for more opportunities at Whitewater than they did at Hofstra. We got more support from the university. In fact, um, the building that housed the general special education program um, had a gym that was not used by you know, the regular basketball team. So we had all the time a gym and, uh, and a weight room. You know, and that was also where the physical therapist who was hired to provide services for all the students you know, also became the team trainer. Um, it got to the point too where or some of the players like Melvin Jewett was among um, the players I interviewed was the first one to make the wheelchair basketball national team. You know, they even had given keys to the building that was otherwise closed so they could always go in, you know, and play. And uh, so, you know, it, it turned in, in the Lycans era, like, you know, late 60s, excuse me, I'm sorry, late 80s to, to early 90s, you know, into you know, a conscious effort to attract, you know, elite people. And I guess the, the other students didn't have advocates like that for other sports. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, my guess is, you know, I've been retired for seven years now that 
but the kind of divide that I saw, you know, may not be as may not be as great. Um, with just younger generation have different attitudes about about everything. Um, I know uh, Tracy Chenoweth, who was the coach at the time that I was there, always encouraged, you know, the other disabled students, you know, to come and use the gym and work out with players and so forth. But they had the attitude that, you know, if you're just going to come and sit around, you know, this is not the place for you. And I'll just remind the audience that you do have the option to put any questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so I was also thinking about the, the question of um, non-disabled players. I know um, Dr. Berger explained that, uh, and actually Mark spoke to this too, uh, that is uh, possible in Canada, that's, that's within the rules. Um, the way that the system works, where you have that kind of total of 14 or 15 points that you can allocate, um, does the presence of a non-disabled player on a team increase the importance of having team having players uh, with lower numbers with more uh, significant disabilities? Um, do they kind of does it put a premium on good players with low numbers at the same time? I'm wondering what the impact is of of adding in of the non-disabled player, um, which would eat up a lot of points. Uh, out of that 14 or 15? Absolutely, without a doubt. Yes. And if you can have, uh, like, like Eric Barber, for example, who I mentioned, he had the lowest classification, but he was also an excellent three-point shooter. That mm -hmm. kind of player is, you know, is a real asset and not that, not that common. Do you have any sense of what sort of non-disabled players are drawn to the game? Are they people who had friends or family who might have been playing it because of a disability? Or um, what, what maybe brings a non-disabled athlete to decide they want to try wheelchair basketball? Sure. It's obviously somebody you know. Mm -hmm. And as was Mark was saying, you know, he had able-bodied friends who, you know, made accommodations so he could play with them. And and that, that was true of, you know, a lot of the, uh, the players that I, you know, they had friends like that. So you might have friends or relatives, brothers, cousins, you know, who, who want to play. I don't think, uh, you know, an able-bodied person, if they don't know anybody, would have an interest, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the, the uh, elite players who thrive on competition, their view, anybody who wants to do it, because there aren't going to be that many people mm -hmm. who want to do it. You know, and the, the, if you kept the classification system, um, the opportunities would be more taken away by the higher classified, you know, the, the other 4.5 players. Right, but so it would I, be the players who had a disability, but not as severe. They're the ones right. who would be displaced by the non-disabled. Right. But I think one of the things that Brad Hedrick was getting at, or this idea of a continuum of options, is you know there there could be different formats. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if there were people interested, you get all sorts of formats. You know, for uh, the game. You know, I, I guess one of the things that I talked to some of the players about too was was um, attracting fan interest. You mm -hmm. know, and appreciation. You know. Uh, even, you know, the WNBA has struggled, you know, mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily financially independent, so forth, you know, but I, th I think it's increasing in, in popularity, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I think the, the wheelchair is, adds a different uh, viewer element to it, mm -hmm. you know, that just while I was watching sled hockey you know mm -hmm. this the other night and you know it's it's kind of interesting and fun to watch you know it's a different game so that's been a challenge you know i guess the wheelchair also presents a significant kind of cost barrier for someone who doesn't have to use a wheelchair right if i understand how much do yeah. good good wheelchair good good athletic wheelchairs cost uh 2500 yeah 
Nobody is going to do that unless they're real serious about it. And unless a program has the ability to partially fund that, it's going to be, uh, you know, untenable. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem with our youth team was trying to convince a parent who's already under the, uh, under the yoke of increased medical expenses with their kid. They wanted to just fork over 2,500 bucks, buy the kid a wheelchair. It'll benefit him. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to check the chat to make sure we don't have any other questions. I know we're, we're just about out of time, but I mean, that is such a difference, right? Because one of the differences with basketball always used to be, you you know, you kind of just needed a a ball and a hoop and you could play as opposed to even football, which required more equipment. Um, Let me ask, because we are running out of time, um, ask uh, Dr. Berger or uh, Mark Drummer, I kind of I think of you as, as both kind of experts in different ways. If you have any final thoughts about uh, maybe um, where wheelchair basketball might be headed, we kind of looked backwards, right? Um, what do you see, uh, Dr. Berger, you've, you've spoken about kind of challenges of any wider appeal, but um, what do you see if, uh, as the future for um, wheelchair athletics? Well, I think there's a gradual evolution just by just looking at you know commercials and coverage of the Paralympics and and so forth, which I I speculate has something to do with um, the Afghan and Iraq war mm-hmm. veteran experience. Um, so uh, we're you know we're a long way from being able to you know put. 10,000 people in the stadium, you know, but I guess you can get a couple thousand, but you know, in, in Europe, this is a much bigger deal. That's you know? right. And some of these players make a lot of money. Matt, Matt Scott, I, I just reading about him that, you know, he went back and finished his degree, but he had like left after like one or two years to go make, you know, $70,000 in Turkey. And my first is, reaction was well that's that's too bad you know he didn't finish his degree which i said he eventually did but then i got thinking well that's what like regular college basketball players do right so on on that level you know good for him i have a a couple of echoes to that Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the players that i coached as a kid uh came to us when he was 14 is uh currently unless he's retiring the captain of the men's paralympic team uh steve sirio he also played professionally in Europe, in Germany, I'm pretty sure. And he made a bunch of money and he did it for like three or four years. And he's back in the States now. He's, he, say, he said to me, he's, uh, he doesn't want to play professionally anymore. But uh, yeah, but he had already gotten his degree at that point. But it's, if you take a look at the opportunities in Europe, why isn't that happening here? I don't, I don't, I don't understand why it's not happening here, except too many things to do here too many Game Boys, too many things to distract other people from going to these games. Um, Maybe not so much in Europe. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is, if you notice, coverage of the Paralympics uh, is is uh, an important tool in making the the, uh, sports for the disabled accessible to the average public. And uh, if you take a look at the trajectory, they're on more and more now. In the last couple of Olympics, they finally started to put them on primetime TV. Mm-hmm. So um, that's a uh, that's a that's a huge advantage. Ron, I'm just curious. So when Whitewater was an elite team competing for national championships, what were the crowds like? Well, the gym were filled. I mean, well, when we would host these national championships, it was it was great. I mean, it was, it was exciting, you know, the, I, I just have this memory of like, um, this was the year we had the big guy, Joe Johnson, but we all also had Opie three point shooter. Mm-hmm. And he, he uh, shot a three point buzzer beater to win the national championship. And everybody put myself just like rushed the floor, okay. you know, and it was a big celebration. So that the people who go to a game and see it, they're like, wow. <laughs> You know, they, what they see that these are like athletes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, that might be part of it is just getting somebody to a game because I've, 
I've gone and thought that's it, that's amazing. And you realize very quickly you could not do that. Um, right. On on campus at Hofstra, we were given the opportunity to charge admission to the games to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, as a group, we refused to do that because the object was to get more people to see it. And so we wanted to have the crowds there. We had, um, when the year that we won the East, one of the years, we won the Eastern Conference and we finished 15th in the country that year, we were in the regional tournaments. We actually hosted at Hofstra the first round of the playoffs uh, against a team from Cleveland who came in to play us. We beat them, which moved us on to the regional in Richmond where we eventually lost. But the point of that was, uh, they had Hofstra actually tried to make that an ongoing, uh, tried to make that a going prospect. They opened up both sections of bleachers instead of just the one. Mm -hmm. we must have had a couple hundred people there, probably, which was disappointing in a way, but uh, way more than we've ever had in any of the other games that we played there. So the more success you have, that breeds more popularity, that breeds more success. That's. That's what I'm getting at. When we, when my youth team won the national championship, we were able to raise considerable amount of money for the following couple of years. And then that petered out mm -hmm. because we were no longer winning. You know, I would just say a part of the success breeds success is that, you know, players from all around the country, you know, want to go to a program that's successful. So you get even better, better over that's a right. period of time. And as you explained with Whitewater, it was from both countries, right? Because there was a significant recruitment pipeline from Canada. Right. And, and now around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ron Berger, uh, as well as Mark Drummer. Um, kind of two different looks at wheelchair basketball. And we sort of timed this because it was about the beginning of, beginning of March Madness, but we'll mm -hmm. maybe get... Uh, uh, when all the attention is for the stand-up basketball, we'll try to get a little attention for wheelchair basketball as well. But thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who uh, came and listened. Um, I really appreciate it. Again, thank you to the Cultural Center, to Kathleen and Carol uh, for all their help as well. Um, have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>